Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India The study of equilibrium picked up a lot faster among the French and Germans in the middle of 19th century than it did among the British until of course, Stanley Jevons started writing. But very interesting precedents to many modern usages in microeconomics, neoclassical economics happened through these writings in France and Germany. So, what we shall do now is to look at that, but before I go into that let me attend to Sharanya's question. Can you say that again please? It was a very interesting remark. Is found hmm. in economics or outside of Right. You see she is saying the answer to the question why were there entrepreneurs when there, had, there was zero rewards for entrepreneurship in the, in the Walrasian system. And she says could the answer have been found outside of economics? We are absolutely right. In recent times attempts have been made to explain this institutionally. Um, in terms of certain types of behavior patterns, in terms of certain certain social psychological rules which probably the entrepreneurs were following. Whatever you are right, I mean uh, there is no logical economic answer to this question and the answer is probably either not available within the economics of Waldorfian systems or the answer is available through institutions outside economics. Is that okay? Right. One of the most interesting work pieces of work done at this point in time simultaneously when uh, people like uh, Leon Walras were doing their thing, you had people like Cournot in France, a mathematician doing very interesting piece of work. Cournot like J. B. Say, he was a follower of J. B. Say, rejected any notion of absolute value in economics. In the sense that you did not need any absolutes. What J. B. Say argued and what others said even at his time and later was that you do not need the notion of an absolute value to talk about what happened in a marketplace. Because what happened in a marketplace happened between buyers and sellers between demand and supply. So, why do you need any of these abstractions in the market? Kuno was one of them. He said you do not need to believe in labor theory of value, embodied labor and all that sort of stuff, all that sort of stuff. You do not need that in the process of understanding what happened in market between players in the market. What is enough is to see that uh, there were prices in the market which measured as an index of the way the economic actors behaved in the market. Secondly, Kurno went a step further and said you do not even need the idea of utility in the market. Not because he thought it was irrelevant, he certainly thought absolute values were irrelevant in economics to understand the market. So, he did not think that uh, utility was irrelevant really, but he was one of the earliest ones to discover a very central problem with utility, very central problem which did not get sorted out till Hicks arrived in the picture. This is the problem which started with the definition of uh, utility by the early utilitarians like Bentham. Bentham was a staunch believer in Smith. He believes that the driving force 
is the preference for pleasure among people that is Bentham. He also believed that you could measure the contribution of objects, situations and people to each other's happiness or pleasure by a thing called utility. You might do something for me and that might have utility for me. I might, I might eat an apple and that has an utility for me. Utility then became a very central criterion among the utilitarians. Not just in measuring the benefit through physical consumption of goods, but through a whole lot of social situations. For instance, the utilitarians were strongly supportive of Ricardo when he fought the landowners over corn law, because they believed that rent earnings have no social utility. So, all landlords must be discouraged gradually in the British economy, because they were dysfunctional. So, utilitarians talked about utility in, in a wide variety of situations, most of them social. The central thesis, which not all of them subscribed to, but it was a central thesis was that utility is measurable. You could measure the utility. There was a calculus of utility as Bentham used to say. Now, Kurno ran into this problem. How do I measure utility? He was a mathematician. He said, how do I measure utility? He did not know how. So, he rejected utility. So, he rejected utility not because it is irrelevant. He rejected utility because it was simply very problematic measuring it. The problem of measuring utility were very significant till the 1930s, when Hicks found a way and then later Samuelson found another way of talking about utility without having to measure it. So, when Hicks brought in his analysis of comparable comparability of commodities and indifference among them, the problem of measuring utility was sidestepped. The cardinal measurement became ordinal measurement. We all know this in microeconomics, but that took a long time in coming and when Kurno was writing, Hicks was not around and offered offering these solutions. So, when Kurno wrote, he said, well, I am not interested in utility because I cannot measure it. So, he rejected absolute values and he rejected the idea of utility underlying consumption. So, he looked at price formation in a strategic sense. So, he was not looking for a general equilibrium solution as was Walras. He was looking for situations where pricing became a strategic decision making process. So, he argued first of all that if there is a monopolist supplying a product, how would he behave with respect to his customers. And he invented for the first time in economics the marginality rule that goes for all firms today that marginal cost equals marginal revenue. It came out in Kurno's writings first. Kurno says a monopolist maximized his profit if he behaved in such a manner that marginal cost equals marginal revenue. And today you know that not just monopolist, but everyone including those under perfect competition have to follow this marginality condition to maximize profits. So, this comes from Kurno. But the thing which was very interesting and which today is quoted as a standard paradigm is his study of duopoly, which is suppose there are two producers, 
and each of them trying to control the market and neither of them being fully able to control the market. Their behavior in the market would be a response to how they expect the rival to behave. So, they would quote a particular supply for a particular price hoping that their rival would be quoting something. So, if the rival quoted so much I am going to quote this. So, if this one quotes this the other one says oh if he is going to quote that. So, you know a succession of expected behavior of the rival prompted each participant in the duopolis market to make his own quotations in the market. So, this was strategic equilibrium this is not an equilibrium in the conventional sense either in a partial equilibrium analysis or general equilibrium analysis. So, how does this happen let us look at Kurnos basic model. Now, we have here two players in the market in the duopoly the small a small a curve there is a little mistake here you must notice that the two curves are intersecting the, the, the symbols are misplaced. So, assume that the, the flatter one is small a small a and uh, the steeper one is small b small b. So, these are a's and b's response curves in the market the two axes represent prices and supply. Hmm. Now, start with some price initial price p 1 which is prevailing in the market and let us say a's response is to b at this point d which involves some supply, hmm. but if a is producing d then at that price b is going to produce e and if B is producing E then A is going to produce F and so on it goes on till eventually it will resolve itself at point Z or Z right. At that point there is a coincidence of expectations each is expecting expecting the other to be at Z and therefore, that is their equilibrium. Hmm. Is that clear? So, Kurnos equilibrium is a strategic equilibrium even today this equilibrium because it is stable it's, it ensures stability because both producers both suppliers have reached simultaneously the same expectations it is called the Nash Kurno equilibrium even today. What was proved through the simple duopoly model of Kurnow can be established game theoretically and therefore, it became Nash Kurnow equilibrium. What is important in this analysis of Kurnow is not simply that he was looking at duopoly he was bringing in a very major factor into the reckoning he was pointing out that market responses by players in the market or supply responses by players in the market were often conditioned by each other's behavior in the market which then means that all market could be looked upon as strategic behavior and that takes one step further the argument then such strategic behavior must have other reasons as motivation than simply profit maximization. You see I am suppose I am op operating a taxi service between IIT and the airport and back and I have a rival who is operating a taxi service and I am constantly timing my 
schedules, my rates, everything in response to what I think my rival is scheduling them as. So, what would be my central most preoccupation? Do you get my question? Again, okay. I am talking about when pricing becomes a strategic issue, the whole lot of motivations which are assumed in a market economy such as profit motives may become irrelevant as a part of strategic decision making. Mm -hmm. And I am saying as an example, let us consider a situation where I am running a taxi service from IIT to Minambakam and back. Yes. Profit decisions become irrelevant through strategic decision making. That is what I am asking. That is what I am asking. Will people be concerned with profits at all or would they be concerned with something else is what I am asking. As an illustration, I am going into this particular taxi thing. Suppose I am running a taxi business between airport to IIT and back and I have another guy who is operating a similar taxi business between airport to IIT and back. Then I am all the time scheduling my time schedules, scheduling my arrivals in airport, departure timings, my rates, tariff, everything in response to what I am expecting my rival to do. Hmm? If he has 5 rupees per kilometer as a rate, I say, okay, sir, I can offer you 4 rupees 75 paise. So, you see, or if he is getting in time to airport to pick up passengers arriving in a particular international flight, then I look for a more crowded international flight and make sure I get there in time first. So, all that is happening all the time is I am thinking as my opponent, my rival would think and trying to evolve my strategies, right. But sir, as, uh, as I said, profit becomes irrelevant. Because there will be a point beyond which uh, they, there will be no undercutting of price. I mean, you know, there will be no price undercutting. So it does mean that somewhere, you know, they have, if the M, uh, if the MC and the uh, MR, I guess, they become equal. Beyond that, they won't go lower than that. So that's so the point where they are not economic. Yeah. So. But I am saying you still can't say profit is irrelevant. I mean, even the whole undercutting thing is happening with why. I mean, it's more of a the whole strategic game is happening, keeping in mind profits. Excellent. I accept this, which is why I started with the question is profit relevant? I didn't say profit is irrelevant. But what is important at this point is to show that there can be a vortex developing here, vortex of strategic behavior in which each is trying to get an advantage at some loss over the other. But the vortex will converge at a point uh, of equilibrium. It may or may not. But it won't go, I mean at least uh, what you have studied it does not go lower than no, that. No, below, it, it might, below the. If yeah. they collude, it, they might yeah. settle at a point of equilibrium. Mm, so, we are now talking of more strategic behavior. So, you have a meeting with each other and say, okay, listen uh, my pal. I mean, we do not want to get destroyed completely. So, let us assume that you know till somebody else comes, we will follow the rule that we will not charge below this per kilometer or we will we'll not operate less than, we will not operate more than the size of a fleet each and so forth. In other words, you get together to create a, create a collusive equilibrium, right. One way to end the vortex is to have a collusive equilibrium. And that collusive equilibrium is a is fundamentally fragile equilibrium. Fragile because does that answer your question about profits? Okay, we still have to answer. She says, in all the strategic behavior, why do you want to talk about profits at all? Is that what you asked? What were you asking? How can profit become irrelevant? Relevant. Irrelevant. Irrelevant. Well, that's that's what we are discussing right now. 
profit might be relevant or irrelevant, but survival is relevant here in this process, because uh, they understand that fundamentally the, the best way to have profits is to have 100 percent control over the market. And that is not possible when the other guy is around. So, you have strategic decision making and the strategic decision making leads to a vortex of negativity and losses and this is overcome when you reach a collusive equilibrium through a collusive arrangement which sort of preserves you. So, survival is possible in this market through collusion, growth is possible or profit is possible when one of them goes to some other market and starts making profit there. Anyway, the point I am trying to make at this stage is the work of Kurno draws attention to the fact that when market is not competitive, there are a whole lot of criteria which might come in as important considerations in the mind of the participants in market which may not be profits alone. It is true that competitive markets ensure profits, but the moment markets are not competitive then there is all kinds of predatory behavior which is possible in the markets. No, this whole approach to markets to the market economies where individuals may not be concerned with profits because the markets are not competitive and markets are following other rules and there are whole lot of other considerations that come into the minds of the economic actors. This idea lies at the heart of the theory of new theory of industrial organization. I had an occasion to mention this in one of the earlier classes, uh, did I not? Some of you were around in that class, I was talking about Bain, I was talking about market shares, certainly all of you were not absent in that class. Anyway, so I will quickly recap. Um, the theory of new industrial organization uh, commences around uh, 1960 when uh, a Harvard economist called Bain produces a classic called entry barriers in American industry. Entry barriers you remember right and it started a whole lot of debate on what is industry in doing in the US, what is business doing across the world. And you found that the prime consideration for uh, people in the market in that kind of a situation was market share and we discussed a whole lot of uses or strategies or tactics which are used in order to maximize market shares or to hold on to market shares right. What is crucial here is to understand that everybody seems to be in the modern corporate world as perceived by Bain, they seem to be thinking very much like Kurnos duopolists. Not so much in terms of supply response, but in terms of each is trying to respond to the anticipated or expected behavior of the rival. So, Kurno model is one of the earliest works in economics which talks of this kind of behavior which has been substantially picked up by this new theory of industrial organization and there is lots and lots of work done in that. One of the important aspects of this is uh, there is an extensive work done on the theory of contracts, implicit and explicit contracts. you might leave you might sign an explicit contract with a particular business partner, but your market situation might be such that you might need a lot of other guarantees than simply what is explicitly mentioned in these contracts. So, you add a lot of lines in the middle which will imply more guarantees for you. Now, the theory of contracts tells you that the more and more and more elaborate a contract gets the more and more expensive it is to enforce the contract. So, there is an optimal trade off between the size and detail of and the complexity of a contract 
and the cost of enforcement of that contract. Now, all this literature in a sense follows the line developed by Cournot. So, that is how important Cournot's work is. Now, let us look at another economist from France, Dupuy. Dupuy is a pioneer in yet another sense. Dupuy says that all public utilities, he focused on public utilities in the sense that what are public utilities? Can you tell me? Natural? Monopolies. Um, uh, there would not be entirely natural monopolies. For instance, a road is a public utility. A bridge yeah, is a non public non Yes, non rivalry is one important. Even that is a public good thing. Even that is a public good argument. Public utility is more a case where there is a very um, elastic demand curve facing the producer. And the sunk cost concepts come very heavily into public utilities. You have to incur the expenditure and recover your revenue over a very long time over a large clientele base. You dig you for instance you make a road, you recover the cost of having made the road through tolls as more and more number of people are using the roads, you collect more and more tolls and recover more and more of your sunk costs. Right? Now, public utilities have this kind of a problem bridges, roads, uh, dams, many of these things. Some of them have specific ways through which you can recover cost, but some of most of the public utilities, the problem has always been how do I recover cost when the number of customers in the long run will be open ended. So, if I know there is a finite number of users of this utility, then I shall be able to plan some tariff through which I can recover. If I do not know, then what tariff shall I plan? What is the best way in which the government which uses public funds to start a public utility, how can it maximize public welfare in this process? Dupuy found a very simple rule. He says use marginal utility pricing. Whenever marginal utility is declining, You can keep pricing the product lower and lower and lower and lower and maximize public welfare, which is something like a surplus here, a rent here. In this diagram, for instance, you find there is a marginal utility of the utility which is shared by all the customers, and as the price drops from P1 to P2 you find that the total collection of revenue is P2, C2, Q2, O, mm. but something like a rent remains with the public because the total utility gained is R, C2, Q2, O. Right? So, maximizing public welfare by pricing public utilities, Dupuy made this illustration and showed the region R C 2 P 2, which is the surplus utility gained by the public goes on in increasing as the prices go on dropping. So, he says when, when marginal utility of a public utility is is, is declining, then the lower the price, the higher the public welfare. This is Dupuy's argument. Hmm? Now, Dupuy is truly the pioneer, truly the pioneer of an extremely complex issue in modern economics, pricing of public utilities. For instance, question is, 
I am running a bus system for the city, I have 20,000 buses traveling all kinds of routes and all kinds of distances with all kinds of stoppages. How do I plan the tariff? How should the bus fares be decided? It is a big issue or alternatively I have built a huge road, there will be any number of users who come and use this road. How do I decide what tariff the tolls will charge? Hmm? So you have or I built an airport, a number of planes will come and land there and take off. How, would, how do I charge the tariff for the aircraft companies which use the airport? Most important, I generate electricity and vast number of customers are using this electricity. How many rupees should each customer pay per unit of electricity sold to him? The problem of pricing public utilities is a huge problem which is continuously theoretically challenging uh, economists worldwide over the last 50 years. Various answers have been found, various solutions have been found. Various models have been tried from very simple calculus based math mathematical models to entire computer simulation models involving 15, 16 variables. All kinds of things have come into existence, but for all this the pioneer is Dupuy's work. That is how important Dupuy's work is. Let us look at a couple of Germans, Gossen. Gossen's work was very profound, very simple, very elementary. He is the one who actually formulated that utility at the margin is declining through consumption. And second, he is the one who also formulated the idea that you can maximize your satisfaction by trading off consumption of commodities according to the levels of their marginal utility. You go on consuming the two commodities till such time as the utilities, marginal utilities of the two commodities become equal. This is something very basic we know now in microeconomics called the equimarginal utility principle, but Gossen is the first propounder of this rule. So you can see that some of the things which are very common to us today, they have their origin quite some time back. So if uh, schools are teaching equimarginal utility principle today, for instance when I was taught equimarginal utility principle in my school. I just assume it just came from the heaven, you know, like everything in economics. Yes. Alfred Marshall. No, it came long before Marshall. You see, Marshall put a lot of things together, but the first idea of equimarginal utility is in the writing of Gossen, some decades before Marshall. It is true that Marshall synthesized everything in very nicely, but if you want to look at the provenance of the idea, the provenance goes to Gossen. Another concept in economics which is very, very common today without which you cannot have microeconomics at all, the concept of opportunity cost. Von Thunen was the one who first pronounced the idea of opportunity cost. What is opportunity cost today as you know it? Krishna? Uh, the cost of giving up one good for another. Mm. The cost of the alternative that you give up yeah. or the loss of the alternative use, no? No, the idea that resources could have competing uses and competing ways of utilization 
and if you choose one particular way of utilizing resources the opportunity cost of that which is the alternative which you give up is an index of the value of that utilization. This idea of opportunity cost came from the works of Fontunen. Fontunen also formulated a fairly clear cut theory of distribution. He argued that all factors of production were paid in accordance with their marginal products. They earned their rewards in accordance with their marginal products. So, he generalized this to say that different segments of society such as capitalists, workers and so forth, they earned their rewards in accordance with the performance of the resources which they supplied into the process of production and the way the marginal products behaved. So, von Thunen introduced this theory of distribution as a fair and a just theory of distribution. In contrast with many socialists and at the in this time what devotees of students sorry students of Marx were also arguing that capitalism is unjust, unfair and so forth. So, one von Thunen was the one of the earliest ones to say well if you are getting the equivalent of your marginal product you cannot expect anything better it is a fair and a just system. So, the, the, the articulation of the first version of the marginal productivity theory of distribution must also be attributed to von Thunen. Finally, von Thunen was also trying to explain when firms have different levels of efficiency, when they have different levels of com competence dealing with the markets, then different firms are doing differently in the markets. Some firms are making more than other firms, right. So, they might include their costs, they might include their normal profit in their cost function but they might make something much more over and above the normal profit purely because they are relatively more efficient. So, how do you explain this phenomenon? Fontun and thought this was very much like the problem of rent. You had land of differing qualities, varying qualities when they were cultivated we know the land which is more if more fertile yielded a higher rent and that we know Malthus Ricardo both of them argued that it was a differential rent that is a rent that comes about due to difference in levels of fertility right. Either extensively you can talk about more fertile land being cultivated first then the less fertile land and the difference in earnings between net earnings between the most fertile and less fertile is the rent we know that. Fontunen was saying pretty much in the same way you have firms with varying levels of efficiency in the market. So, he did not assume perfect competition and all those things he said firms could have varying levels of efficiency. So, the firms do make a differential rent right. So, he introduced a way of looking at the industrial economy which used very creatively the idea of oh. which very creatively used the idea of the rent. So, Fontunen's rent is something like this. Suppose you have firms A, B, C, D in the market and the price is let us say some C2 hmm, equivalent to some cost C2 of firm B. So, firm B is selling in the market such that its costs and price are actually equal. In a Marshallian sense this is a firm which is just making its normal profit right. But the other firms look at A, C and D their costs are all below the price is not it. 
and each one of them is making a little rent a for instance is making a less rent than c and d is making even less rent but all three of them are making a rent while b is not making any rent so von fontunen was talking of differential rent among industries among firms as occurring due to differences in levels of efficiency and competence this was a much earlier idea then the idea of abnormal profits which you find in marshall in writing in fact it might appear that the Mar the discussion of marshall on the optimum and representative firm are you aware of that discussion marshall talked of two types of firms he talked of an optimum firm where marginal cost equals marginal revenue in the short run and average cost equals average revenue in the long run there are no abnormal profits so this is an optimum firm but marshall also said at any point of time a firm which is representative of firms in general might not be an optimum firm something like a median firm you know what's a median or a model firm is better something like a model firm which represents a very large number of firms in the industry may be making an abnormal profit may be making a little bit of loss we don't know because the economic conditions are constantly changing and the response of firms to changing economic conditions the process of continuously adapting themselves that's going on so a firm might hit an optimum point at one point might slip off it and go into a loss next time or go into an extra normal or abnormal profit so marshall distinguished between a representative firm and an optimum firm according to him a representative firm is a firm which may or may not be making normal profits but it might be making abnormal profit it may be making losses it all depends upon the context and the situation in which the firms find themselves how they are adapting themselves to changing conditions so marshall's optimum firm was a kind of a theoretical best and he was very clear to emphasize that in actuality a representative firm which was a firm which was some kind of a model average need not necessarily be behaving like an optimum firm at all now this interesting distinction is slightly preceded by fontunen's argument here about differential rent he is also talking about efficiencies and performance levels of firms in the market he is also talking about some firms making a little extra which is marshall in abnormal profit and some firms which don't make anything so he says by and large this is important according to fontunen most firms are firms which are varied in their performance usually the price in the market is a price which equals the least efficient firm's cost at any point in time firms have different levels of efficiency the least efficient will have the highest cost according to fontunen most of the time in the market the prevailing market price equals the cost of the least efficient firm which has the highest cost in this particular case it is firm b which has the highest cost so he says all other firms earn differential rent so once again you find a very interesting situation here an argument which certainly predates the discussion on representative firm just fontunen says you may not have a representative firm in the picture at all and we do not know fontunen says we do not know what criteria of efficiency will measure levels of efficiency in firms it was left to marshall to bring up this concept to bring in the notion of a u shaped cost curve in the short run long run and so on and so forth but fontunen was ahead of marx so he couldn't say all those things in his time what he could say was 
the most the prevailing market price is equivalent to the highest cost prevailing in the market which is the least efficient firm. All other firms which are more efficient end up making something like a rent, a differential rent because it is a rent owing to differences in their skills just as differences in fertility of land existed. So, little comparison see this is how Ricardian Malthus differential rent will work. You have different levels of fertility in a declining order there and you have uh, wages determined by O w and profits determined by P w and the whole region above P is rent. And you can see that lands with differing levels of fertility are making lesser and lesser and lesser rent. Finally, you get to a land piece of land the 1, 2, 3, 4th piece of land which is just enough making enough to cover profits and wages. Then you have the 5th piece of land which does not even make profits which just covers the wages. So, the idea of a differential rent is basically Malthus and Ricardo acknowledges although it is called Ricardian rent Ricardo acknowledges that it is Malthus who first wrote about it. So, which is why I said it is Malthus Ricardo rent. So, Van Thunen's differential rent as you can see is substantially similar to and comparable with Ricardian Malthus Ricardo rent only thing is Van Thunen's application is much wider than the case of land which is what Ricardo Malthus application was. So, with this we kind of come to an end of discussion of different kinds of equilibrium theories were thrown up at this point in time we came from we started with say and went on to Walras to show how the orthodoxy developed, but outside of that orthodoxy we saw a few illustrations of how people were thinking in terms of equilibrium and efficiency in the market economies and how they were achievable. Now, I am open to questions remarks. Anybody? Okay, then I will go one step further and explain this idea of differential rent and how it is applicable in again in modern economy. You see uh, most firms in the modern economy corporates their pricing strategies are influenced by two sets of factors one cost plus margin which is a pretty fun and kind of a situation. So, every firm plans its pricing strategy in terms of what is my total cost of production including provision for my margin and then I may make a little extra margin on top of that which is my cost plus basis. So, all commodities are fundamentally priced on a cost plus basis, but how much more plus here the criterion that comes into operation is what is the pricing strategy of my rival. So, I want to make it a cost plus strategy, but I want to make sure that I do not lose out my market to my rival. So, once again you have everybody trying to fix the highest possible cost plus as a price within the limits which is very reminiscent of one Thunen, what one Thunen is saying right that I try to for instance maximize my differential rent here. So, if I am a firm who is able to cut costs minimize my costs then I can have this differential rent which is not possible for others who are not able to cut costs. So, the economy of uh, costing and pricing in modern business is not so much like uh, the marginal cost pricing or average cost pricing which goes on in the theory. They have a composite notion of cost which includes a certain margin for ma management entrepreneurship and so on and so forth, certain provision for contingencies. This composite cost is what is available to the firm and the firm is now looking for a pricing strategy over and above this and while it is doing that it is looking around at the market seeing what the rivals are doing right. So, pretty much what should be happening in a Fontan and kind of a market they look at firm B and say we do not want to be like firm B we want to we want to be a lot better. So, let us cut costs and become more efficient 
so they may become like firm A or C or D. So once again the application of this idea that firms are making rent is very significant because in actual pricing strategy most modern firms are actually trying to make something like this Fontoon and rent. We will break it up today and get back on Saturday and start with socialists and Karl Marx.